Good morning, everyone. A lot of familiar faces, as well as some to be familiar faces. So, before we begin, let us all take a moment to pay homage to the supremely enlightened one, observe the precepts, and make a start on today's program. Can you all hear me loud and clear at the back as well? Not enough. That's better. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So let's pay homage to the most magnificent one, the supremely enlightened one, the fully awakened one, the Supreme Buddha. Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa First and foremost, I want to thank you all for being here today. Until perhaps one day you shall realize that you ought to thank me for being here. But we'll get there eventually. I want to thank you on behalf of everyone who, thanks to you, will enter the path and will eventually follow in your footsteps, take your guidance, consider you as their teacher, consider you as their inspiration, their motivation. and will achieve the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. Today you may not even know who they are. Today you may have no cognition of who I might be speaking of, but in your footsteps will walk many hundreds if not thousands of men and women just like you do today in mine and just like I have done in my teachers and he in his. And as we tread this path all the way back to the greatest teacher that mankind has ever seen. This is the way the noble lineage passes from generation to generation. Dare I say that there is no one too young to be here, and there is no one too old to be here either. You have all given up what most would consider a very important day of the week, hmm? a Sunday, especially a Sunday morning. As I'm sure you'll have a million things that you could have been doing right now if you stayed at home because such is life. It's very busy, isn't it? Of course. I know it because I've been there. I've been to that gig and I bought the t-shirt and then I sold it. Apparently someone bought it again. <laughs> but some or other, luck would have it or good fortune would have it that we have all come together here again. <clears throat> I say again because this is not the first time. It might seem that Swami Nuhanse is probably a new face to some of you. And it might be that your faces are newish to Swami Nuhanse. But 
The truth is, we've met countless times before. And you know what? I've had enough of it. So hopefully this will be the beginning of an end. Hopefully from here on, we can count the number of times we shall meet again to eventually have no meeting again. You know, when a patient goes to a doctor, any doctors in the house? Just give me a show of hands. Excellent, we have a fair few. When a patient goes to the doctor, and the doctor obviously does everything he or she can to help the patient, and now the patient is cured, right, fit. And as the patient leaves, would you like for the doctor to say, thank you very much, please come again? Hmm? Any doctor who's worth his salt, if they were to say that, you'd be very concerned, wouldn't you? Because that's not something you should hear from a doctor. Thank you for coming, please come again. Because you only go to a doctor when things don't go right, when things start going south. When things are not going right, that's when you need a doctor. So in the same vein, I'm here today, and I tell you, we have met today. My hope is that we don't meet again. Not something you would normally hear on a first talk. So I'll tell you right at the offset, right at the outset, perhaps some of the things we might discuss as we make headway might sound somewhat unconventional. This is why I think I saw on the banner out there, it said, for the open-minded people amongst, amongst you. You've got to be open-minded. You've got to be receptive to new ways of thinking. When you head back home today, dear ladies and gentlemen, and children, parents, mothers, fathers, brothers and sisters. If someone were to ask you, what did you do this morning? You can say that we went to listen to a talk. And if they ask you, who was it? Can I ask that you don't say it was a monk, but instead that you say it was a scientist in a robe? I hope you will realize why very soon. As I said, I have been just where you are today, and this is a very conscious choice that I have made to come here, to be like this, and also to come here and help you work out the magic of life. It is a magic when you don't know the logic. To you right now, life might seem a mystery. All the ups and downs that come your way. When things happen and you try and scratch your head wondering, why do all of these things just happen to me? Have you never been there? Hmm? I'm not on Mars, am I? No. I'm just like you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a very normal person. I'm not a very special person. I'm a very normal human being, just like you. I breathe like you. I eat like you. I walk like you. I rest and take sleep like you. We're all the same. It's the same blood that runs in my veins as it does in yours. I love my parents just like you do yours. I adore my teachers just as you do yours. We are very similar in many ways. Only I can't say in every way. But that is not because today I'm in a robe and you're in 
well, just as you are. That is not why. That is just the outer shell. If there was one way, you might ask, Swaminwansa, how are you different to us? Are you really all that different? I've already answered half that question. Most of me is just like you, except perhaps for one and one thing alone. I have taken a different perspective to life. I think of life differently. I think life has more to offer than perhaps what most, most of you might think. I want to live life 100% and nothing less than that. I want to take everything that life has to offer and nothing short of that. So really, if you ask me what these talks are about, one might think, is it about Buddhism? Is it about the Four Noble Truths? Is the Swami Nuhansi going to talk, about, talk to us about the afterlife? Or is he going to talk to us about the previous lives? Is he going to give us a convincing argument for reincarnation? Or is he going to talk to us about karma and vipaka? Or maybe, or just maybe, He's going to give us a lesson on Abhidhamma. The truth is, I'm just going to help you get the most out of the lives that you've already been gifted. Now, as I can see in the audience, there are people who are in various points in their life. There are the young, the youthful, and let's say the less less than young. So there's more young and less young. Hmm? Is that all right? The very youthful and the somewhat useful, youthful, not useful, you're all useful. Hmm? The very youthful and the somewhat youthful. But as I was sharing with uh, my venerable monk while we were waiting for you to prepare and get ready to ask us to come up here, I said, Swami Nuanza, do you realize how much all these people, because we saw you walking in, we were parked out there, so from the rear view mirror, we could just, we couldn't make out who it was, but we could see people walking in. And, you know, dressed in white on a Sunday morning, you know, you don't get brownie points for guessing where they're going. So, we gathered, you were coming here, and what I mentioned to the, to the Swami Nuhansi was, do you, see, uh, do you see how much they're all still looking for one thing? You correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, but I don't think I am, that the vast majority, if not all of you, are reasonably well off, reasonably. Reasonably. You don't struggle to make ends meet. Because if you did, how do I say this? Because if you did, you'd have other things to be doing on a Sunday morning. You'd have to be somewhere else on a Sunday morning. Then your weeks wouldn't be Monday to Friday. If you struggle to make your daily sustenance, to win your daily bread, then your weeks wouldn't be Mondays to Fridays. It would be Sunday to Sunday, or Monday to Monday. So the very fact that you can be here, you can afford to be here, means you're reasonably all right. You get along. Reasonably. And I think, so we, check, we asked who the doctors were. If I asked who the engineers were, the lawyers, the physicians, the mathematicians, the physicists, and so on, the teachers, right? Amongst these professions, you will find yourselves. In fact, if I ask who are the mothers in the room, some arms will go up. Fathers in the room, arms will go up. Mothers-to-be and fathers-to-be, arms will go up. So these are all 
goals and ambitions that people have in their lives, some of which you will have already achieved, others you want to achieve. But, ladies and gentlemen, if you were sat where I am right now, you'd see everyone in this room and you'd come to one conclusion. Now, you can't see everyone from where you're sat. I have that vantage. But I can tell you this. You have all veered down various paths and routes in your life from the day you started life on this planet. Because you all came out the same place. You all came out of your mother. So it was the same place you all came out of. But life and circumstances took you down different paths. Who you are today are the varied and numerous choices that you made along the way. Right from the way you wear your hair or the fact that you have no hair like me, who are half monks. The car you drive, the school you like to send your kids to, the place you, you like to work, the things you like to eat, the places you like to go, where you like to live, and how you like to decorate your house, the place you call home. All of these choices that you have made, they're all so different. How is it when we're all human beings, and in that sense we are all the same, the choices we have made are so different? You've got to think about this. Why is it that the choices you have made are so different? Now, a couple of days ago, we did a, a talk at an international school, and we were talking to a bunch of 7th, 8th, and 8th, 9th uh, graders. So there were about 600 students in the audience as well as teachers. So I asked this question from the, from the young children. Now children, you know, they're very innocent, right? So they just speak their hearts out. Hmm? There is no moderation that has to be done. Because they've got no reputations to keep. No false impressions to make. They're just themselves. It's like you when no one's watching. That's kids everywhere. So when I ask them this question, why is it that you're all so different and you make different choices about life, they came up with some really interesting answers. Some said it was because we are different personalities. I didn't expect that from a seventh grader. Some said it was because their likes and dislikes were different. Now I think some of you can relate to that. If I ask you why are the choices that you have made, why are they so different? You can tell me it's because our likes and dislikes are very different. Would you agree? Yeah. Perhaps the influence that you have had in your lives, the friends that you have associated, the places you have been, the, the, the values maybe that your parents would have instilled in you. These and more will be countless reasons why the choices you have made have been so different. But why did you make those choices? Were they only because they were inevitable choices that had to be made? When you were at a bifurcation and you had to choose right, left or right, you made a choice. Perhaps you had to make one of those two choices, but nonetheless you made the choice. When it was, who do I get married to? Hmm? That's one choice most of you have made. And regret? I don't know. Uh, every man for himself, eh? <laughs> no assumptions, okay? But you made that choice. There were plenty of fish in the ocean, but you had to settle on one, and you made that choice. Now, aren't you thankful that your choice was different to someone else's? 
Read between the lines. <laughs> Aren't you grateful that the person that you thought hmm, was the most beautiful girl in this world was only your opinion and no one else's? Just imagine, just imagine if perhaps you, your best friend and some other friends thought the same. Wouldn't that be chaos? As perhaps some of you might say, well, Swami Nwansa, it was a tough time. I call dibs, huh? but someone else came and said, no, I want her too. And then we were on an equilateral triangle. <laughs> See, in life, we make these choices based on our personal preferences, our likes and dislikes. You've made the choices you've made, but here's the thing. I guarantee that if you've not heard what I've had to say before, now I have to put that caveat in because I can see some familiar faces, and although I told them not to come here, will they listen? Oh, no. Some people just never learn. Don't know why I bother. I told them not to come here. I said I want to talk to new people, fresh faces, and they're still there here. So anyhow, I would like to propose that although you've made the choices that you have made, <clears throat> you, still, you don't know why. You don't know why you made those choices. You don't know why. In fact, there have been times in life where you retrospect and you ask yourself this very question. Why or oh why did I decide to do that? If only I'd been just a little bit more patient, if only I'd let a little bit more time pass, if only I'd listened to my mother, <laughs> huh? if only I'd taken my father's advice. He told me a hundred times no, but did I listen to him? I thought I knew best and I made that choice and today, oh how I wish. Why did I make that choice? Was I so foolish? These are some of the things that sometimes you tell yourself. Because to this day you don't know why you made that choice. Not honest, not really. You really don't know. You'll have some explanation for it, like preferences. You know, he said so, she said so, I fell so, it felt like the right thing to do. Then why regret today? See, wouldn't, there, wouldn't it be nice if there was a principle, hmm? a rule that you could use, whereby any time you had to make a choice, you apply that principle, and every time that choice is the right choice to make, so that you don't have to regret? How about that for size? What do you think? Are you up for that? What if I could give you a principle? Hmm? What if I could offer to you a principle? Let's say an, uh, an equation, a formula. If I could offer you a formula where you have a number of variables and you punch in the values for those variables and at the, on the other side you get, this is the choice to be made. So that you never have to regret. How about that? What do you say? No? Oh fine, let's talk about something else then. I'm asking you, do you want it? Huh? Then come and get it. <laughs> I have that formula. The formula of no regrets. Do you remember the last sleepless night you had? It wasn't very long ago, was it? That night when you thought, it's been a long day. I have to go to bed now tired and then you shut your eyes and then what happens when you shut out the outside world now the inside world starts to cause mayhem does it not yeah how do i know all this been there done that i can relate to you ladies and gentlemen because i didn't ordain as a young child i didn't ordain as an infant I lived life. 
I lived a full life. I was just as ambitious as I am today back then. And I was just as ambitious as you are today. In fact, if you'd seen me when I was a lay person, and I had asked you, where do you think I'll end up in 10, 20 years time? You'd be wildly off the mark. Because I knew no bounds. I had no boundaries. I had a really good start in life, thanks to my parents and thanks to my teachers. Even to this day, I'm ever so grateful to them. The first occasion I had to go on Pindapatha in the town of Colombo, I asked our driver to stop by my favorite teacher's house so I could pay my gratitude to her. But unfortunately, she no longer lived there. I think time caught up with her before I did. There are things that I would like to have said to her. Things that I'm going to be sharing with you over the coming weeks. But unfortunately, I don't get to do that with my teacher, my favorite teacher. She was the teacher who taught me Sinhalese. Because I spent a fair deal of my life traveling around the world, living in a, in, in a few countries. And when I came back to Sri Lanka in grade six, I remember to this day, the first word that I read in the book was Ibba. I didn't know who an Ibba was. So I asked my friend, what's an Ibba? And from that day, I earned myself a nickname. Until someone decided that I was too tall for the class, and then I earned myself another nickname, Otua. School days were fun. I enjoyed them. But fun most of all because of my teachers. I admire my teachers. Those of you who know me will know that. And those of you who are teachers will know why teachers are to be admired. We've all had teachers and we've all had parents. So anyhow, I can relate to your lives, ladies and gentlemen, because I've been there. I left Royal College uh, just after my first year of A-Level, so I, I never completed my A-Levels here. And then I, we went to the UK, settled down, where I did my A-Levels. I always wanted to be a doctor. Who doesn't, eh? See, I come from a very normal background. <laughs> Well, that's the done thing, isn't it? Most Asian parents want their children to be doctors. <clears throat> because my father was a scientist. So as I get to know a bit about you as we go along, I'll share you know, bits and pieces about me so you know, we can get to know each other. And all this because I want you, I want you to walk away with a, with a bit of confidence that what Swami Nuhansi says, he says with conviction. He, he speaks to us because he understands us. I want you to walk away with that, if nothing else. So I relate my story to you from time to time for that reason and that reason alone. So I know where you come from. I know where you're going. And I know where I would like to get you. But that you don't know yet. Allow me to show you a different destination. You don't have to make big changes in life for that. I've made that change on your behalf. Let me come and talk to you. You be just where you are. You don't have to come and sit next to me. You know what I mean by that, right? Because I understand, dear mothers and fathers, dear brothers and sisters, that you are caught up in a myriad 
of responsibilities, duties and obligations. And as much as you might perhaps have considered and maybe will in the future consider a different walk in life, perhaps there are certain boundaries that can no longer be crossed. Maybe there are certain locks can, that can no longer be unlocked. So it is not my ambition to come here and tell you, what the heck are you all doing? Let's go to the temple and let's get ordained. Let's all become monks and nuns. That's not what this is for. Even less so to try and make you all Buddhists. No. As I said, I'm not a Buddhist monk. I'm just a scientist in a robe. What you see here is simply a lifestyle that I have chosen. For very good reasons, which I will share as we go along. You don't have to become a monk. Nibbana is not very far away from where you are right now. And that nothing could be more true than that. Nibbana is right where you are. It's right where you are. My job is to try and help you realize that. It's not to find Nibbana, because to find something it has to be You've got to be somewhere and it has to be somewhere else. Yeah, that's when you have to go finding something. Hmm? You find a lost pair of keys. You find your, your, uh, your umbrella. You find a lost child. You've got to go looking for it. But why is Nibbana a realization and not a finding? What do you have to realize? It's right where you are. That's not a finding, that's a realizing. I will help you do that, I promise you. All you got to do is just bring yourselves. That's all you got to do. So we went to the UK and we settled down. So at that time, we was just my mother, Apache, Amma and my brother. And then time passed. I did my A-levels, as I said. So I was quite keen on becoming a doctor, so I chose the subjects that would help me become one. I was fascinated by biology, but more specifically human biology. So around that time, this subject came into the, into the curriculum. I loved it. How the body works, how all the parts of the body work in unison, how what you put in here can actually go all over your body and make this wonderful machine work. It was so interesting. Physics, chemistry, maths, those were the things I used to spend my time with. But somewhere down the line, I realized that although I was to become a doctor, I wasn't supposed to become that kind of doctor. Funny how destiny works. <laughs> so somehow, I, I believe I achieved my ambition, but in a very different way. I was not meant to become a doctor in the conventional sense, in a very different sense. So I gave up my idea on medicine and then I chose something else that would pique my interest around that time and that was computing and finance. These were the two things that really interested me next to medicine. So I went into university and started doing a degree in computer networks engineering. And you might think, what? So I'm in Hansi here, did computer networks, what's going on? I myself look back at my past today and wonder, wow, that was one heck of a ride. So after I graduated, then it was time for me to tie that knot What not am I talking about? <laughs> Some refer it to as the noose round the, <laughs> round the neck. Huh? No, but she was different. As I'm sure everyone will say, right? She was different, yes. But in fact, she was my childhood sweetheart. 
We'd known each other from lower kindergarten. And it was in fact in grade one when I had decided she was going to be my life partner. <laughs> See? Love at first sight does actually work. Give me a show of hands if you're married to your first love. You got to say yes, come on. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So then it was time for us to, you know, she was here and then I was there. It was time for us to live together. And so with our parents' blessings, we came together and we started living a quite a happy and comfortable life. She was quite, quite keen on traveling the world. I wasn't so keen at first, but then she showed me the wonders and pleasures of that. And so I joined that bandwagon myself. And to travel the world, of course, one of the biggest hurdles there was, was you had to apply for entry permit to the country. And that was getting a bit too much. So then we decided if we just had a passport that allowed us to travel, then we could. So whilst we were there, we'd been there long enough. So for one reason and one reason alone, I mean, what use is it to me today? The only reason I wanted was to travel the world with no hurdles, no barriers, no boundaries. So we both got our British citizenship and then we started traveling the world, enjoying life as we did. Little did I know that everything was about to change. So as we were enjoying life, as you'd expect, one day one of our friends asked us to come around for a meal. And we did, like all good friends do. <clears throat> and so as we walked in, people started coming, filling the room, filling the, the living room up. So we realized that there was going to be some kind of event. And so then a young man walked in, uh, in his late twenties he was by that time. I've said this story many times. I love hearing it. That's why I'm saying it again. <laughs> my favorite story. <laughs> how I met my mother. <laughs> More like how I met my real mother. My last mother in Sansar. <clears throat> so uh, this young man walked in and I saw him, he saw me. I didn't know what he was there for. He knew exactly what I was there for. So I walked up to him and said, hello, Machang, how are you? As you do. Uh, he said, yes, I'm very good, thank you. It's good to be here. But a few minutes passed, uh, about half an hour passed, and the room was then arranged just like it is today. So there were chairs pointing this way, and there was one chair pointing that way. And guess who went and sat there? This Machang. And then he started talking. We all started to listen and he started to speak. I didn't realize that five hours passed from the moment he started to say his first word. Time passed. Minutes turned into hours. And only when I saw dawn, the light of dawn, the light of daybreak, did I realize that it had been about five o'clock in the morning, or around that time, when the talk came to an end. My life changed completely. That was the day that I found the purpose of my life. It took me a good 20, six, seven, eight odd years to come to that realization. But I realized that there was much more to have and to achieve in life than the mere pursuits of materialistic gains. Conventionally and materialistically, I had a good life set for myself. You know, I wanted to retire by the age of 40. And I had it all planned out. 
I had my investments done, I had my properties, I had this, I had that, money in the bank, pension planned out, all sorted, because I worked at the bank. So after I graduated, I wanted to, I was bad, computing and finance was what interested me, so I went and worked for an investment bank. <clears throat> That's where all the money is, so if you want the money, where do you want to go? It's where the money is. <laughs> So a good five years at the bank and I'd worked out a nice retirement strategy that would keep both my wife and I very happy for the rest of our lives. But then this happened and then this happened. If back then you'd worked out my net total value of my net assets, I think at the tender year age of 22, 23, <clears throat> and please don't think I'm boasting, I'm only sharing this story because I want you to understand that I can relate to where you are, so I can help you see a different path in life. At that age itself, I think I probably would have accumulated enough wealth than most people in our country would in their entire lifetime. I wanted to help others as well. So it was not just all for myself. I wanted to become successful so I could help other people. That hasn't changed. Some things <laughs> never change. So I wanted to help other people. And my wife was so keen on that as well. You know, once a year we would come to Sri Lanka. And one of the first things we'd do is we'd go shopping. No, not for ourselves. We'd go shopping and buy dry rations and clothes and all sorts of things for poor people. We'd pack them up in bags, go to the local temple and ask the monks there, Venerable Sir, please can you bring around you know, 10, 15, 20, however many families that you can gather up on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a day that is convenient for all of them and we will come and we, will, we would like to distribute what we have. We loved doing that. Absolutely loved doing that. It gave us so much joy. And that was only the beginning. I had big plans to help do away with poverty. That's what I wanted to do. No one needed to be poor in this world. So these were some of the grand plans I had. And then, as I listened to that man speak, and he opened my eyes to a different reality in life, everything changed. And today, I own nothing. My net assets today, I can count on the five fingers that I have on my hand. In fact, two of them I don't even need. You're already looking at one of them. That is the robe that I have on me. I have another one because when this goes into the washing, I need to be in another robe. And then I have my arms bowl. The only possessions to my name. So if, you, if my teacher kicked me out of the temple, out of the monastery, those are the only three possessions that I can actually walk away with without anyone questioning me. To take my toothbrush, I have to seek permission. But on the day of my ordination, I was handed two robes and an arms bowl. I don't even have shoes. I don't have a watch on my wrist. I don't even have to worry about my hair anymore. I'm a very simple man. I have nothing to my name. So, it begs the question, does it not? Why are you here? Shouldn't you go to someone who has everything? Hmm? Normally when you go to a talk, when you go to a seminar, hmm? you go to someone who has something more than you do. So you can learn how to acquire that. Maybe you might go to a, a, you know, a, a person who is very rich, or perhaps someone who is very successful in business. Maybe he's a, he's, a, he's a magnet. Maybe perhaps he's a, 
know, he, he owns a massive estate. <clears throat> so you can learn a thing or two about how to become successful. You've come here and met with someone who has nothing. I have nothing to give you. So why have you come then? Here's why I suggest. I think why you have come. I think you've come because you are beginning to realize that all the things that you have have not helped you achieve contentment. You're working hard, trying, striving, doing more every day, every week, every month and every year. Every year you start with new ambitions, new hopes and new dreams. Right? Next year I'll do this, the following year I'll do this. Perhaps you have yourself a 10 year plan, maybe 20, maybe even 50 year plan. So did I. By 20, I had a 20 year plan, by which point I was due to retire. <clears throat> and I'm sure you do as well. But you realize, do you not, that in that plan, and the plan that you have come along thus far, you have still not been able to achieve what you really wanted in life. Why you made those choices, you're still not sure. In fact, if I were to summarize, has it not been a case of the blind leading the blind? Now, some of this might sound a bit harsh. I don't mean it to be. I'm just speaking the truth. Because when I sit on this chair, after I have worshipped the supremely enlightened one, he who is the founder of the truth, I can speak nothing other than the truth. My teacher changed my life by speaking the truth. And I want to share the truth with you and nothing more, nothing less. You realize the choices you have made in your life have yet to make you happy. You are still not happy, are you? Not fully. No? You sure? Shall I throw a few at you? Do you still get angry from time to time? Do you still get annoyed? Bothered? Frustrated? Worried? How about that? Anger is not good, is it? Anger, we don't like to be angry. But what about worried? That's alright, isn't it? Worried? I worry for you, my dear child. I worry for you. I mean, come on, parents. Being a parent and being worried are synonymous. Hmm? They're synonymous. If you are a parent, you're worried about your children. If you're a child, you're worried about your parents. You're worried about your future. You're worried about the economy. They're worried about your business. You're worried about your friends. You're concerned. That is why I said, can you think about the last time you had a peaceful night's sleep? Most nights are sleepless nights. Are you still counting sheep to help you sleep? Depression is big nowadays. I won't be surprised if I ask people in the room to give me a show of hands. But I'm not going to ask you to do that, don't you worry. Who believe they are either clinically or on the verge of clinical depression. Stress, eating into people. We, weren't used, we didn't used to be like this, but now we are. Three generations ago, do you think your great-grandmother was depressed? Perhaps she was oppressed, but never depressed. Perhaps today you'll say, you know, we women of today's day and age, we enjoy more liberties than, we, than our great-grandmother did. Hmm? We can roam around freely, we can drive, we can vote, we can do everything a man can do. But you know what? She was happier than you. 
And I mean this in the nicest way. I want to help you. You must only come here if you need some help. I went to my teacher because I need help. I'm still at, with my teacher because I still need help. When we were at the school, at the end of the, uh, the program, some of the teachers came around and they sat around me and they asked me some questions. They said, Swami Nasa, can, I, can we talk to you? I said, sure. So there was this one teacher, fine gentleman, he asked me this question. No, Swami Nasa, no, I've been listening to you, to you speak. You, you, you talk about, like, there are, you're, you're, you're able to sever attachments and bonds that you have to various things. Aren't you afraid to die? He asked me. A wonderful question. He said, is there nothing you fear? Do you not fear death? I said, sir, out of all of us, I am the one who fears death most. I am the one who fears death most, out of all of us. He asked me, but why? Sir, because I have realized the purpose of my life. I have realized that there is a higher truth to be achieved in this lifetime. It is more valuable than anything anyone else in this room is going after. This is what I told him. I understand that this is invaluable. And to do that, I need my life. Whatever it is left of it. Whatever is left of it, I need it. Because I still haven't completed my path. I haven't completed my journey. I haven't reached my final destination yet. So therefore, I treasure my life. You know, I used to say, it's just a funny story. Right? Back then, as a layperson, if I was to cross the street, okay, and say if there was a granny waiting to cross the street, I might go and stand in front of her and give her some cover and say, Achi, wait, let me hold your hand and cross you. You know, today, I'll go stand behind the Achi. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I want you to understand what I mean by that. Today, I'll go stand behind the granny and ask her, please give me cover because I have something immensely valuable that I want to achieve in my life. So he asked me, are there any possessions that you are worried and scared of leaving behind? I said, yes, there is just one, my teacher. I need my teacher, but anyone else, you can take it at your will. I used to feel the same about parents and friends, but now I realize that it, more than I need them, they need me. <laughs> Not me, but the message that I have to, have to give. I'm useless. Totally. I'm worthless. So, you know, as we progress, as you come along and we meet each other, right, let's get that on the table as well, right at the start. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am not after a following. I don't want followers. I want students. A student is with a teacher, not because of the teacher. A student is with the teacher because of the teaching. I don't want you to be my disciples or my followers or accept everything I say at face value. Please no blind faiths. I am not your savior. All I am is a very simple man carrying the Buddha's message. If you want a teacher, there he is. If you want a teacher, there he is. All I am here to do is to carry the Buddha's message because this was the message that has helped me achieve the freedom that I have today. Because it is the truth that sets you free. And the truth is not me. The truth is the message. The message of freedom. So today I have nothing. In fact, if you put yourselves and I on a scale, right, you'd sink to the depth of the ocean and I'd be up in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in space. 
That's how the scales would tilt. I have nothing. But in having nothing, I have everything. You know what I have nothing of? Nothing that worries me. You know what you have everything of? Go on. Yes, madam. <clears throat> You drove in today, didn't you? <clears throat> in whose car? Your car. It's parked outside, right? Huh? In a moment, you're going to hear a big bang. Who's going to be running out? Me or you? Please don't think I'm mocking you. I want to help you. I'm not against having property. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, have and use everything but own nothing is a nice principle for life. If you can use anything but own nothing. Today, I use everything I need. Anything and everything I need, you provide. Not because you are my devotee, but because you want to earn merits to help you on your journey to Nibbana. Because in life, you get what you give. If you want love, you give love. And in, ex in return, you get love. If you want kindness, you give kindness. And in exchange, you earn kindness. If you want hate, you give hate. What do you get in return? Hate, of course. How do the rich become rich? By hoarding or by giving? By giving. Why are the poor so poor? What are they poor at? Giving. What are the rich rich at? Giving. That's why the rich are rich and the poor poor. You know, when you begin to understand the Dhamma, you will begin to realize everything in life, everything, like you've never done before. You will realize how fortunate you are that your parents are still with you. You realize how lucky you are that you can still offer your dear old mother a glass of water at night and kiss her on the forehead and wish her good night. Ask someone who's lost their mother and they'll tell you. But through the Dhamma, you will begin to realize all these things. I promise you. You know, this is a journey, as I've said, as it says out there, it's a step by step journey. I have a million things I want to tell you, but not all of it at once. I can't do that. Because I have to convince you. I can't expect you to walk away and do things just because I ask you to do so. No, because you are not my follower to follow what I ask you to do. I'm not your boss. I'm not your manager. If anything, you might consider or you might, you might, you might choose to see a leader a leader is not someone who demands. A leader is someone who leads and inspires you to do something. You should only do things that you're inspired to do. Because as I said, if I leave this room saying, thank you for coming, see you again, you know, I don't want to be saying that forever. There must come a day where we can depart and say, thank you for having come. Ta-da. Let's never meet again because you don't have to. I want to give you what I carry, this message, so that it's yours to keep. And then once it's yours to keep, you can help others as well. That is what I want to do. So I don't want to keep doing these sermons forever and ever and ever. No. I want to see a light at the end of the tunnel. There must be a day where we can bring these sermons to a close. At least, You'll bring along new people as you progress. 
And you can stay at home. You can carry on with your path practicing. Perhaps there will be some of you who will choose if your merits would have it, the lifestyle that I have chosen. But not so soon, because I will explain to you some of these things, why I chose to become a monk. <clears throat> when in the same breath I'll say, you can attain Nibbana as a lay person also. So then why did I choose to become a monk? Is a very valid and good question to ask. <clears throat> So, coming back to the point I was talking about earlier, here we have two people, or two types of people, those who have everything and someone who has nothing. So why have the people who've got everything come to, to, come to a talk given by someone who has nothing? <clears throat> Did they promise you a free meal? Or an ice cream? Or maybe a coupon? Or a shopping voucher? What did you come here for? Was anything promised to you? No. So why did you come then? We have to admit. Because there's still something you are seeking. Perhaps you don't know exactly why you're here. But you know you're here for something. You don't know what that is yet. That's okay. Part of this is to try and help you figure out what you're looking for. Isn't that what some of the best teachers do? Like, you know, when you were younger, right, you were asked the question, weren't you? What would you like to be when you grow up? Hmm? K Sarah Sarah. What would you like to be? And then what did mother say? The future is not ours to see. <laughs> well, I tell you, the future is ours to see. If only you opened your eyes and started looking. So when we were younger, one of the best things, the best teachers we've had in our lives, they helped us find the, the inspiration that we had within ourselves. They never said, you've got to be this or that. And I've, I've had parents who've come and, come and shared their stories and how they bring up children. They've said, Swaminans, I never force my child to do this, that or the other. I allow them to choose. But whatever they choose to do, I help them to do the best they can. So that they're happy doing what they want to do. In the same way, ladies and gentlemen, I am not here to enforce a way of thinking on you or to get you to choose the life that I have chosen, all I want to do is to give you, make available to you all of the options. Wouldn't you like all of the options laid out bare in front of you? Because right now, you've only got some of the options. The choices you have made, you have made because you only saw some of the options. There's another option. It's not monkhood. I'm talking about an attitude. I'm not talking about the way of life. So please leave this behind. Leave, please leave this behind. I'm not talking about becoming a monk. I'm talking about a monk's attitude. There's the lay attitude and there's the monk's attitude. I'm talking about an attitude. I'm talking about this. Let's continue doing everything you're doing so far. Let's continue doing business. Let's continue being a mother. Let's continue being a father, a brother, a good citizen. Do whatever you have to do, but do it with a different attitude. So now, is there anything you have to give up? Am I asking you to give up anything? So much so that I think, this is only my personal opinion, that anyone who speaks in the name of Buddhism and says, you have to give up, I don't subscribe to that. Because in Buddhism, there is no giving up to do. I told you, it was going to be unconventional. Unorthodox. There is no giving up to do, so fear not. I shan't ask you to give up anything whatsoever. So please don't go packing up your stuff or getting those divorce papers ready. <laughs> huh? No, I'm not allowing any of you to ordain. No, no, no. Please don't come and even ask me. 
Not until you're ready. You know, at our monastery, by this point, we have about 115 monks. I'd say 95% of them in their youth. None of them have come there having given up. So you're saying, Swami Nasa, that they had nothing to give up? Meaning they were, you picked them up from the slums? They had nothing to give up? No, that's not what I mean. You know, they realized that nothing was theirs to give up. Do you see the difference between the two? You only have to give up what, what belongs to you, right? Hmm? You only give up what belongs to you. What if I made you realize, or I helped you realize, that nothing actually belongs to you? No, what must you give up? Hmm? Nothing. So any person who speaks Buddhist philosophy, who's worth his salt, I believe, would only say this. Fear not, because in these talks, in these sermons, and neither did the Buddha talk about giving up, letting go. These are some of the things that you'll have heard of. And I've got nothing against people who preach so. Let them continue. But what I'm saying is, if you come here, if you want to listen to these talks, I'm just perhaps maybe giving you a bit of a, a friendly warning, maybe a bit of a caution. This will be a little bit different to what you've heard before. I've said, open-minded. You signed the dotted line. I hope you read the small print. <laughs> I want to make Nibbana easy for you, not difficult. Give me a show of hands if you believe Nibbana is not something we can do in this life. You have to be born again. Maybe wait until the Maitri Buddha comes along and perhaps then we will do it. Or maybe you've you got to die, go to the heavens and then do it. Or maybe in your next birth, maybe in, a five, in 500 births time. If you think Nibbana is impossible at this point, in the lives that we live, okay, maybe we are too old for it, maybe we are too young for it, maybe we, start, we haven't started enough, we haven't done enough, we don't have enough merits for it, so said um, our, our parents, so said our teachers, so said the Swami Nuhanse, whoever. Maybe you read it somewhere in an article. Nibbana is not within reach, and it's not something I can do as a lay person, but alas, I can't go and ordain myself either. It's just not possible. So therefore, what can we do? Just live a lay life and you know, hopefully one day Nibbana will happen for us. I bet there'll be plenty of you in the audience who will be of that opinion. I'm telling you, it's time to change that. I'm here to say what you can do, not what you cannot do. But this is more than just a motivational speech. Nibbana is simply a change in attitude, not a change in lifestyle. There is nothing you have to let go, dear ladies and gentlemen. Please try and understand what I'm trying to explain to you. There is nothing to let go. If you have a luxurious lifestyle, if perhaps you live in opulence and you, you, you are, you're accustomed to uh, you know, uh, an indulgent lifestyle, so be it. There's nothing you need to let go. You don't need to leave your home and go into the forest. You don't need to isolate yourself in a cave somewhere. You don't need to renounce your lay lifestyle. What you need to renounce is your lay attitude. That's all. So then you might ask me, but, 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 Swami, no? So Prince Siddhartha, let's go back to that story. He had a kingdom to his name. He had a beautiful wife and he had a young son. Didn't he have to renounce that before he could go and become the Buddha? In his mind, he was already a monk. Mentally, the transformation had happened. The physical transformation came later. What's wrong to do is to make the physical transformation first and then hope that your mental aptitude comes to you later because then people suffer. Buddhism is not to suffer, it's to free yourself from suffering. You know, here's a sad story. 
Wherever we go to Malvatta, where we go to meet the Mahanayaka Theros. So we have the high ordination of Atta Monastery coming very soon. Tomorrow, day after, we'll be going to Malvatra again. And every day we get to hear a very sad story. So this time round we'll have some 30 odd Swami Nuhanses who will be receiving their high ordination. All in their youth. A very sad story we, we hear when we go to Malvates. He tells us, every day he has to sign papers as the Mahanayaka Peru. You know what papers? Death warrants. No, not that kind of death warrant. He signs the papers that is a warrant for the death of a monk. No, not that kind of death. Someone disrobing, going back into lay life. It's a very sad story. A very sad story because it could have been otherwise. If only they'd become a monk in their attitude first and then chosen the lifestyle of a monk, that wouldn't have happened. That is why if ever you come, into, come to our monastery and have a look at what we have there, the setup we have there, the program we have there. Today you would have seen two gentlemen who've come with us. They wear the Anagarika badge. They're in training. We train them for up to two years before we deem they are ready and they deem they are ready to ordain. Because we have to check first that their attitude is right. That they're ready to become a monk that they have understood that there is nothing to let go. You know what happens otherwise? You let go everything, and then you come, into the, come to the sasana, become a monk, and then you realize, oh, I need them again. <laughs> oh, I need to watch TV. Oh, I need to play with my friends. I need to go on the internet. I need my Facebook friends again. I need my girlfriend again. I want to go traveling, I want to go eating, I want to go sleeping, I want to go do this, that and the other, but I can't do it in a robe, so what do you do? One of the most unfortunate things a human being can do, disrobe. We practice what we preach. So this is why I carry the same message here today to you as well. You know, at our monastery, ladies and gentlemen, we have children from the age of seven. If you ever come and talk to them, you'd be gobsmacked at the understanding that they have. And you'd think, how can a seven-year-old know so much? Seven to seventy, we have the, the whole lot, the whole range. We give them education as well, a good education. For one reason alone, because, you know, in Nibbana they don't teach you how to tie your shoelaces, right? So we've got to teach them that. We've got to teach them that when you heat water, it's going to boil. Because you need to learn a bit of science to live. I'm a scientist, so I know how much science has helped me live a convenient and comfortable life. Because if they ever go on Pindapatha and they don't know, you know, right first, left first, right first, and right again, you know, they're going to cross the street <laughs> as if they would at the monastery. What's going to happen then? Of course. So you need to learn a thing or two. And for one other reason, parents, sometimes parents are ever so slightly worried, as, as most parents are, what if my child decides to come back home again? In which case, you know, they'll have missed their education. Oh, there's one other reason. By statute, we have to teach children. So for these three reasons, we teach our children. We don't just teach them any old thing. We give them the best education there is. They're preparing themselves for Cambridge exams. They all, some of them also follow the local syllabus, others follow the international syllabus. It's up to them what they prefer. We teach them languages. At our monastery we learn about 15 languages. You know why? 
because you are a very small population of innocent people who need help. I was fortunate to have known the language in which my teacher taught. I understand Sinhalese. I understand a bit of English. Because of that, I was able to be helped by my teacher. But what about all the people out there? What about people who only know Hindi or Telugu or Tamil or Japanese or Mandarin or German or Spanish? Who's going to look after them? Who's going to help them? As you progress in the path, ladies and gentlemen, I, you will begin to realize all these things I'm sharing with you. I'm, I'm sharing you a bit of this and that, you know, from here and there today. You know, this today is kind of like a, a bit of everything, right? But as we go forwards, you know, uh, we will, we will, we'll find a nice little path to, to walk along. But today I'm kind of, you know, showing you everywhere. Just so we get to know each other a little bit. We've come to realize that we are all the same. Before the Dhamma struck me, I thought we were all very different. I thought I was a man and you, madam, were a lady or a woman. I thought I was black and you were white. I thought I was Asian and you were Caucasian. I thought I was a Buddhist and you were a Muslim. I used to think that I was rich and you were poor, or that you were rich and I was poor. I used to see the world as black and white, ones and zeros. Today, I see that we are all one. To borrow an expression from the Holy Bible, Today I see that we are all children of God. We are all one. Because ultimately, all we are are minds that are looking for one thing. Just take an introspective examination of yourself for a second. Isolate yourself for a moment from everybody else in this room. It's just you and I. Okay? Just imagine. Just, just do what I'm asking you to do for a second. It's just you. Now you are sat on that chair. I'll ask you this simple question. See if you can give me an answer. Who are you? Your mind will start flooding with answers. <clears throat> You'll say, sir, or venerable sir, I am, and you'll come up with a name. That's usually the first thing you'll say. Right? I am so-and-so. How do you know? My mother said so. Yes? Or, my father said so. So then that's not you. That's what someone said who you were. I'm not asking about that. I'm asking who are you? Not who someone thinks you are or who someone says you are. I'm asking about who are you? What is your identity? Who are you? Then you'll say, I am, um, Swami Nasa, I, I, I am a teacher. How do you know? Yes. Someone said so. Because you have a certificate somewhere that says you graduated as a teacher. Conventionally, people have come together to the, and can come to a conclusion, come to an agreement that they shall call you a teacher from now on. So really, your teacherness depends on their being students. Yeah? So it is because you, there are students who choose to call you a teacher, are you a teacher? So therefore, again, this identity that you've given yourself is a very subjective one. In other words, that's not who you are. If I ask you to come up here and give a speech on myself, 
Hmm? Pretty much everything you say will be things you've heard of, heard from others about yourself. You might say, well, but I live in Colombo. How do you know? You don't live in Colombo. You live somewhere, people call it Colombo. If they renamed all of the geographies in the country, right, you would no longer be living in Colombo. If they renumbered all of the states in, in the Colombo city, or the provinces in the Colombo city, you'd no longer be living in Colombo whatever. This is all a convention. What is a convention after all? It's what people agree. We've all come together and we've agreed, let life be so. Do you not need that? We need it. We need it for convention. We need it for convenience. Convention is for convenience. But in an absolute sense, you are none of those things. Okay, another question. Oh, sorry. Uh, another thing that one might, you might say is, I, Swami Nuhansa, I'm a parent. Who says so? How do you know? Well, because I have children. Ah, there you go. So your parenthood relies on you having children. So again, that is a subjective definition. So who are you then? Have you not found the answer yet? Who are you, 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 you? Who are you? I'm talking about you. Who are you? The truth is you don't know. You don't know. That is why you don't know why sometimes you make irrational choices. You never made irrational choices? Hmm? You don't have never made those choices like we said right at the beginning? Oh, why did I choose to do that? Oh, what a fool I was to, to decide to do that. See, irrational choices. What is your favorite color? You'll all have an answer. Okay? Why? Why is that your favorite color? Let's, let's pick one of these red. There are red roses here. Hmm? There'll be some among you who, whose favorite color is red. My question is, why? Why is red your favorite color? What does red do to you that pink doesn't? What does red give you that green doesn't? Does it look after your children? Or do the school run? Does red do that for you? Does it cook your food for you? So what's your, what's, why, why, so why is red so special to you? Why do you not treat green the same way as you do red? <laughs> exactly, madam, you don't know. Rational or irrational? Irrational. Where's the rhyme, where's the reason? Where's the logic? No, see, this is why you are such a mysterical being. You feel, of, you feel about yourself as a mystery. You are a mystery. Because you don't understand yourself. Why do you like long hair and not short hair? Or vice versa. When you saw him from afar, why did you think, oh, he's nice. He looks handsome. Why did you think that about him and not about the man who was stood next to him? who your friend thought the same of. Why? Where's the rationale? Where's the logic? You don't know why you find some things pretty, do you? You don't know why you find some things ugly, do you? You don't know. You just know, I like it, I don't like it. But you don't know why. How would you explain it to a scientist? How would you explain it to a scientist? You can explain it to an artist, but not to a scientist. So much so that you will say, well, Swami Nuhansa, I'm a work of art. <laughs> what do you expect? I'm a work of art. <laughs> the problem with the work of art is this. You never know when it's done. You never know when it's complete. And you never know when it's right or wrong. 
Whereas if it were a science, you'll always have precise answers. You will know this is right and you will know this is wrong. You will know left from right. You will know when it's enough and when you need more. But you don't know right now. If we did a quick survey of what are your what's your favorite item of food? Hmm? Do you think that all of you will give me the same answer? What do you think? No, of course not. Why? You will share some of the answers that the children at the school did. They'll say, because personal preferences, likes and dislikes. Okay, personal preference, why? Likes and dislikes, why? I'll keep on asking why, because you don't give me an answer that I can be satisfied with. Because you don't have an answer you are satisfied with. Are you all with me here? Hmm? Does this all make sense to you? At the back? Yeah? All makes sense? As I said, I'm here to help you understand yourself. Not about whether there's reincarnation or whether they're gods or brahmas or demons or devils. Let's put all that to a side. There's, there's one devil who we don't, haven't understood yet. <laughs> Huh? So let's not worry about the, see, the devils that we cannot see. Huh? When there's a big devil that we can see, but we don't understand yet. Why do you make the choices that you make? Why are they so irrational? Why when you try to reconcile them, you, you, you think to yourself, that makes no sense. Why when asked the question, what is your favorite something, you have an answer which differs wildly from perhaps your sibling who you shared the same womb with? Why? Why do your parents like one thing and you like something else? So now you can't say it was my parents. Now you can't say it's in the genetics. Now you can't say it was in the blood or in the DNA. You can't say that. You know, when your parents said, him, no way. You said, him, please wait. <laughs> you know this happened to you. You know this happened to you. And this is also good stuff for parents because you try and shape your child the way you want, but you don't understand how a child thinks, you don't understand their mental dynamics, so therefore you don't know how to guide your child. Bringing up children in this day and age is next to impossible, is it not, parents? With all the influences that they have to, that they have to endure, hmm? all, the, all, the, all the good and the bad that you, that you, you have to, you, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to sieve the, good, the, sieve the good from the bad and to sift the good stuff from the bad stuff. It's almost impossible. But what makes it even worse is when you don't understand how the mind works. So here, what we are trying to do is to try and understand how your mind works. The one thing that you least understand. Psychology, what is that then? Is that not how the mind works? Buddhism or Buddhist philosophy is very different from psychology. Because psychology is the study of mental behaviors. A person thinks the way they do, and then these are the behavioral patterns that we observe, and it's a study of those behaviors. And to try and, 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 to try and come up with some explanation of what the mental or the mindset might be to, to, to expose such behaviors. That is what psychology is. Whereas with Buddhist philosophy, we go much deeper. It's like if psychology was at the molecular level, Buddhist philosophy is at the quantum level. Now you begin to get a sense of what we're talking about. But it's not difficult. It's not tough. It's not impossible. If a simple man like myself can understand it, anyone can. Your level of intelligence is far more than is required to understand the simple philosophies that govern everything in this world you included. So simple.
What is required is for us to have an open mind and be receptive to some of the things that you will hear when you are here. It'll help if you come along every week. It'll help. But I know there'll be times where you'll have other obligations that will have to supersede this in terms of priority. I understand. How do I understand? How come? Been there, done that. I'm not an alien. I'm a human being. I'm a humanoid or a human link just like yourself. So I understand that. I understand there'll be parties that you'll have to go to you can't say no to. Okay? I understand you'll, you might have to do your shopping on a Sunday morning. And if that has to happen on that Sunday, then you may not be able to come along. That's fine. But every possible opportunity that you get, I urge you to come along. Come with empty pockets. Walk out with a full head. You don't need to bring anything when you come here. And the reason for that is, there are people just like yourselves who started treading this path sometime before you did. And they have begun to understand the value of this. You can't put a price tag on something that is priceless. So the charge for this talk I have already charged. Some people ask me, so I say, you know, a talk like this given in English, you should probably think about charging. <laughs> and then my answer to them is, dear sir, I'm charging by the minute. Because what I want I have already earned. All I need to help me on my path is my teacher to give me the Dhamma and merits to help ease that path. From the moment I sat down here, from the moment I left the monastery this morning at 6.30 to get here on time. Because I wanted to help others to see the light that my teacher has helped me see. To help you to find the happiness that has for so long escaped you. To help you to free, live, live a freer life, a fuller life, a, a life with fewer worries, and if possible, no worries. To help you have a sleep that is peaceful. To help you to be a family man, but without the familiar worries. To help you be a professional in your profession, but, and to sort out all the problems at work, but without taking them personally, without internalizing the problem, looking at it objectively. I can help you do all that. My intention to help you all that has earned me the merits that I need. So therefore I have charged you by the minute, by the second, by the millisecond, and you don't even know it. I only come here for the merits. So if there's someone you know, someone you care enough about, who you feel might help, might, might, could be helped, or might find this useful, bring them along. As you may have heard from what we've talked about so far, some of this will be a little bit unconventional. As I've said, there is nothing for you to let go. So, fear not. You know, some people, they're really worried to listen to a Buddhist talk. I know people like that. They're really worried to listen to a Buddhist talk because they fear that at the end of it, they'll have to let go of everything. I say I have a lot of respect for people like that because they understand that Buddhism changes them. It's not because they don't believe in Buddhism. It's because they do believe and they realize that if, 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 I hit, if I'm hit with that medicine, <laughs> things are going to start happening to me and I won't be able to stop it. 
So I have a lot of respect for them. But at the same time, I appeal to you, you know, you don't need to worry. There's nothing you have to let go. There are people here who've been listening to talks for many years now. They're still living a good life. In fact, they're living a better life. If you bump into uh, some of our regulars, right, and if they make themselves known out of mercy, hmm, you might ask them, you have long have you been listening to these talks? What has it done to you? What has it done for you? How has it changed you? How has it, how has it impacted you? You will get to hear their stories. Those are the testimonials. That is what he has done for all of us. The truth is free and it's liberating. It's energizing. It's empowering. I, all I want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is to give you an alternative. You're living your lives thinking that you have seen everything and these are the only options and you have to choose one from them. I say, before you make the next choice, heed to what I have to say. Because there is another choice. Armed with that choice, continue to live your life. If you continue on this path, here's what I promise will happen to you. As a mother, you will continue to be, but you will become a better mother. A mother who doesn't have to cry, but who will love her children the same. A mother, here's the, hear this, a mother who can love the child next door just as she loves her own child. That is what you will become. If I asked you today, how about we take your child to an orphanage, leave the child there and pick one from the orphanage and bring him home? Hmm? Are you up for that? Call that child your child, but your child you have to leave in the orphanage. And then again, you can't think anything of it. You can't go back and visit him. You can't ask me, can I go and see him every week? No, because you've got a child now. A child has been united with a mother, right? And one child has been departed from its mother and things are as they were before you walked in. But you're not okay with that. Not yet. The Dhamma has helped me be like that. Where to me, every child is a child. So I can love all the same. Whether you treat me as a friend or you treat me as an enemy, to me all I see is a mind, is a human being that needs help. I'll leave you with this. Start to think about this first while, you know, over the course of the next week. Okay? Because if you start thinking about this, you will have something of something that you can bring along next week. So we can start to unravel some of the mysteries of life. Over the course of next week, you will come across people who may either intentionally or unintentionally might hurt you. People who will do things, say things that you won't like them to do or say. Let's assume they're doing it intentionally. This is a problem we all have, right? People do things that you think is unfair, unjust, or unjust, right? Or people do things and you think they do it out of spite, to avenge, okay? Think about this, if this ever happens to you in the course of the next week. Two words, hurt people, hurt people. Hurt people, hurt people. Why do I say the same thing twice? It's a different meaning. What I mean to say is, when people are hurt, they hurt other people. Hurt people, hurt people. So, if ever you are hurt by someone, have sympathy. Because they only hurt because they are hurt. You won't have me hurt you any day, ever. I can vouch for that. 
I can guarantee my monkhood for that. I will never hurt you. Even when the price I have to pay is with my life, I will not hurt you. Even if the price I have to pay is my life. You might think I'm hurting you on occasions, but that is only out of love and compassion. Some of these words might sound, might feel like arrows piercing through your heart, but only because I want them to make an impact. So that you can break out of your conventional thinking patterns and start to see life in a different light. So I promise you, I will never hurt you. I swear to you. Because what you give is what you get. That is the guarantee I can give you. I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to suffer. So I will never impart suffering on you. I will never hurt you. But what I want you to think over the course of the next week is whenever you have people who will walk into your life, tread on your toes, right, trample on your feet, right, metaphorically speaking, realize that they only hurt you because they are hurt. Hurt people hurt you. Now it could be a stranger, it could be someone in the family. You know, even living among family members, you know, there will be times where you get hurt. Just have sympathy. Have empathy. Begin to become a source of loving kindness. Right now, do it because I ask you to. I will show you how it becomes your natural state. How you can be a fountain of compassion. I will teach you how. How you can be the epitome of loving kindness. I will show you how. Because my forefathers have taught me how. My teachers have, showed, have taught me how. 420 people take residence at our monastery permanently. By yesterday's count, 420. We are a big family. <laughs> because people listen to these talks and they realize that there is a paradise on earth whilst they are still alive. So if you want another day in paradise, you're welcome. Visit us when you have the chance. Before you do so, speak to those who come along regularly. Some people's faces we've seen enough of. You just can't keep them away from the monastery. But they come there for a reason, ladies and gentlemen. You know, if you know them, if they're in the audience and you know who, who, who I'm speaking of, you know, they're, they're not fools, are they? They're not buffoons. They're not stupid people. They're not picking the head. Right? They're educated people. They're knowledgeable people. They're respectable people. They're people with authority. They're people with knowledge. They're people with a good know-how. They're experienced people, mature people. They understand a thing or two. So why have they chosen that? Why have they decided to dedicate a, a portion of their lives into something that goes beyond a religion? I am not here to proselytize you. I am not here to preach Buddhism. I am only here to teach you the science of happiness. You have learned biology at school. You have learned sociology at school. You learn astrology, you learn cosmology. I'm here to teach you happyology. Happiness is a science. It no longer needs to be an art. Right now it might be an art to you because you don't know how to be happy. That's why you keep on trying, but it never feels like you are content. Therefore you are never at bliss. You know the old saying, contentment is bliss. But you are never content. That is why tomorrow you have to do something you haven't done today. How many times can you listen to the, the same music? How many times can you eat the same food? How many times can you watch the same movie? Before you say, I'm fed up of that. Can we try something else, please? Yes or no? How many times can you visit the same place? How many times can you go to the same hotel? How many times can you engage in the same hobby? Before long, you get fed up and you want to move on to the next thing. But you did that thing originally because you thought it was going to make you happy. This is a trailer for next week, by the way. Spoiler alert. Huh? You think that's going to make you happy. 
So if something is bound to make you happy, then more of it should only make you happy? Happier. But does it? No. That doesn't make sense, does it? If looking at this at these roses makes you happy, then just keep staring at it all day, night and long, should only make you happier and happier and happier and happier. But what happens after a while? You say, enough. Can you show me something else now, please? Is that not proof that happiness does not come from this bouquet of roses? Isn't that proof that there is no happiness to be found in this? So happiness is not in the object. Ah, I shan't say no more. <laughs> this is for tomorrow or rather next week. Ah, you have to pay for that. <laughs> so enough of the free lesson. So make sure you bring your credit cards when you come next week. We'll have a credit card machine there. <laughs> All I ask you is, make the most of your time here. There are people just like yourselves who started this journey and they want to give what they've got to you. That is why this venue, we haven't paid a single cent for. No one has. Because the, the founder of this organization, the chairman of this organization, the current principal of this organization, he knows what we are about. Himself and his staff, they've gotten together, they've been listening to our talks for a while now, and they wanted to give this opportunity for all of you. For free. But it's not for free. What they're earning out of it, you don't see. What they're earning out of it is the merits that will help them on their path to freedom. See how convenient it is? It's not uncomfortable, it's very comfortable. Air condition, right? nice lighting, audio systems, everything. And the parking, you don't have to worry about a bang from the car park. You even have a security, you don't even have a security guard watching over your, over your precious vehicle to make your stay here as comfortable as possible. You'll probably be even provided refreshments. I don't know if that is planned, but if it is, maybe so. And they expect nothing from you. Nothing. They don't even expect you to say thank you. Trust me. Take it all and leave nothing behind. Until one day you realize, isn't this what we are all here for as human beings? Isn't this the best gift that any man could offer to another? And when you realize that, you will also jump on the bandwagon. You will also become a member. There is no group or a society that you need to be a member of. It's an, it's an invisible membership club. It's a club of Aryans. There are no presidents, there are no secretaries, there are no treasurers, there are no office bearers. Because everyone there wants to be a nobody, not a somebody. When you want to be a somebody, you need a title, right? And you need a chair to go with it. And a name card that says who you are. But when you want to be a nobody, you don't even want a simple thank you. Because you're not doing it for the thank you. You're not doing it for the pat on the back. You're not doing it for a smile. You're only doing it for one thing and one thing alone. Because in this world, we have realized, ladies and gentlemen, there's nothing that is worthwhile pursuing except the ultimate bliss of Nibbana. That is what I'm here for. That is what I want to give you. It's the only thing that is worth giving, in my humble opinion. You can all facilitate that in whichever way is possible for you, whichever way is convenient for you. Just help more people get the essence of what the Buddha had to offer us throughout your lifetime. Because after all, when all is said and done, the only thing that you can take with you is not the money in the bank, or the houses you have built, or the children that you have brought up into this world. It's just the merits that you have earned. This is the currency that's going to help you have a comfortable life in sansara, and also to help you end that journey in sansara someday. I'm going to leave you all with that for today.
once again, thank you all for being a wonderful audience and setting aside a Sunday morning to be here. Before we conclude, I will be doing a transfer of merits. So all the merits that we have acquired by being here, by engaging in these meritorious deeds, there are so many people who are deserving of it. So as I read it out, as I, as, I, as I go through the merit transfer, I want you to think about what it is I am saying. Think of it and in your own mind, repeat it. So you don't have to say it out loud. You just have to think along those lines and whenever there's a moment to rejoice with a sadhukara, you can do so. Because there will be many who will benefit from it. So let's do that now. <clears throat> Let us all take a moment then to transfer the merits that we have all acquired by making offerings to the infinite virtues of the Noble Triple Gem, listening to the Dhamma and engaging in various meritorious deeds today. First and foremost, let us take a moment to transfer the merits that we have all acquired by reminding ourselves how incredibly fortunate we are to be in receipt of the Lord Buddha's teaching and with immense gratitude, let us transfer these merits to the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, upasakas and upasikas, who since time immemorial have protected and preserved the sublime teachings of the Buddha and have passed it down through the noble lineage in the form of the Tripitaka, which is thankfully available to us today to study, understand and comprehend the Dhamma. Let us also transfer the merits we have acquired to all members of the Mahasangha present throughout the world, including the chief prelates of all of the chapters who have dedicated their lives to the noble path and the betterment of all sentient beings. Let us not forget that among them are the monks and nuns resident in your local temples and nunneries who have always been by your side through thick and thin, come rain or shine. Let us also transfer these merits to my dear teacher, Guru Swami Nuhanse, as well as all the monks resident at the monastery, as well as the Anagarikas and Anagarika communities attached to the monastery. Let us also take a moment to transfer these merits and express our gratitude to those who make great efforts to disseminate the teachings of the Buddha, be that by transliterating these talks, sharing them out with others, or inviting others to join them. May by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May by the power of these merits, they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to our devotees, friends of the monastery, who for the sake of merits to help them attain Nibbana, continue to sustain the Mahasangha. This includes everyone from those of you who provide the Mahasangha with shelter, arms, robes and medicines, as well as those who have passed on their know-how and continue to extend their well wishes. May by the power of these merits they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to our fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, grandparents, uncles, aunts, cousins, nephews and nieces, our elders, friends and acquaintances, employers and employees, and to all those who have helped us, supported us and assisted us in any way, shape or form. And by the power of these merits, may they be healed of any physical and mental ailments and overcome any obstacles to their spiritual progress. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer merits to the devas and brahmas, spirits and demons, primarily the Sakadeva, as well as all the numerous gods and deities who are committed to fulfilling the Sambuddha Sasana. Let us transfer these merits to our guardian deities who keep watchful eye over us and keep us out of harm's way. And by the power of these merits, may they prosper in divine power and wisdom. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Let us also take a moment to transfer the merits to our ancestors who have predeceased us, and to all those who have been families, friends, and acquaintances in this infinitely long journey of Sansara, and to those who have helped us, supported us, and assisted us along the way. Let us transfer these merits to the members of the armed forces, as well as the police force, who have sacrificed their lives to, to protect the peace and harmony of our nation. And by, by, these, by the power of these merits, may all those who lost their lives in the war be their friend or foe, rejoice in the merits that we have all acquired today. Let us transfer merits to those who have lost their lives in natural calamities, such as the tsunamis and earthquakes, landslides, forest fires, blizzards, and so on, and pandemics, reminding ourselves that among them will be those who have been friends and family to us in this long journey of Sansara, 
Let us take a moment to transfer these merits to them. And may by the power of these merits, if any of them have been born in the woeful plains, may they redeem themselves and be born in the blissful plain. May they abstain from the unmeritorious deeds, fulfill the meritorious deeds, fulfill the noble eightfold path, and may they all attain the supreme bliss of Nibbana. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And let us all resolve that may by the power of the blessings of all the merits we have acquired today, we be able to witness the advent of many hundreds of thousands of Arahants on this blessed land, and by the power of these merits, may you and I, and everyone who's helped make this program a success, become an Arahat Unvahanse, an Arahat Teran Unvahanse, in this very life itself, and in the era of the Gautam Supreme Buddha itself. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. May the blessings of the Noble Triple Gem be with you all. And the members of the Mahasangha will now transfer their blessings to you. Raga kinnen midetnva Dvesha kinnen midetnva Moha kinnen midetnva Nibbana parama sukhayen Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana parama sukhayen Sukhita tara vetnva Mamada siyalu loka siyalu satnvayo Nibbana parama sukhayen Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana parama sukhayen Sukhita tara vetnva Nibbana parama sukhayen Sukhita tara vetnva Raga gini niveva Dvesha gini niveva Moha gini niveva Nivan sapa labeva Nivan sapa labeva Nivan sapa labeva Tundruan gay suvisi ananta maha guna belin Silo loka silo satayoma Nibbana paramasukin subtitaravetua Sadhu sadhu sadhu